Dr. Michael Clapper. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Darbellis, and thank all of you for coming. And uh, what a thrill, what, what great energy uh, that uh, I feel off of all of you. I, I'm a little jealous. To, I wish I was in your place. I, uh, this is such a wonderful school. I would love to go back to medical school again and learn it uh, as you are. <laughs> um, the, uh, I always have to smile when I hear about that I'm uh, retired. Um, I think not so much, I'm not so much retired as rewired. I've, uh, re, I've done a little re rewiring here, and the best thing I can do is to share the information that I wish somebody had given me when I was sitting in those seats where you are now. <clears throat> The German philosopher Goethe said, uh, what you know about, you see. And it's true. Uh, when I was learning the names of the birds, someone pointed out a mockingbird to me. And guess what I started seeing everywhere? Mockingbirds, they're common birds, of course. Uh, and medicine and medical education is learning about something. And then you go out and you start seeing it. You see it in the operating room. You see it, you know, what you learn in the anatomy lab, you soon seen in, see in the clinics. Um, possible to dim the lights a little bit here? So, so I've been going around to the uh, medical schools, and uh, as I said, I've been uh, giving the students the lecture that I wish someone had given me. And what I'm basically imparting is that uh, in your basic sciences, in your clinical sciences, you are learning all about how to diagnose and treat all sorts of wonderful diseases from leprosy to smallpox. Uh, but when you open the door in your office waiting room, in the outpatient clinic, in the surgical waiting room, uh, in the ER, uh, you're not going to be seeing patients with leprosy and certainly smallpox, thank heavens. Uh, what you're going to be seeing is a large group of people with a small group of diseases. And uh, they are largely uh, having to do with uh, uh, the amount of body fat they're carrying, the state of their arteries, which are clogged up, manifesting as hypertension and uh, hyperlipidemia. Uh, you'll see a fair amount of type 2 diabetes related to the obesity. We'll talk about that mechanism in a minute. Uh, and uh, along with the angina and the strokes, uh, a host of inflammatory diseases affecting everything from lungs uh, to skin to joints to gut. Uh, you're going to see a lot of inflammatory diseases. But when you open up your textbooks of internal medicine and pathology and you look for the cause of these diseases, you're going to run into two words uh, that for most folks stop all further thought, etiology unknown. We don't know the real cause of these diseases. And it's true on the ultimate genetic, enzymatic, molecular level. We don't know every last kinetic step in all of these disease processes. But that overlooks um, a very big elephant in the room. Because, and it puts you as the physician as in a big deficit. Because if you don't know the cause of something, you can't cure it. And that reduces you to the role of managing their chronic disease. And uh, we can't cure your diabetes, we'll manage your diabetes, we'll manage your high blood pressure. I don't know about you, but I did not go into clinical medicine to manage chronic disease. I went in to cure people. And every one of these diseases is curable. The especially dismal part of being a disease manager is the message you give to your patients. What you're telling them is that you'll be sick the rest of your life. Uh, you, will, you will always have diabetes. You're always going to be a hypertensive patient. You will take these patients, you'll take these pills the rest of your life. You're never really going to get better. What a dismal, hopeless message to have to deliver to your patients. And a completely unnecessary one, because every one of these diseases is reversible with a healthy diet and lifestyle, etiology unknown. Really, just take a look at what your patients are eating. And that's why they're sitting in front of you, overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up, and inflamed. It's from what they're running through their bloodstream every four hours with the burgers and the pizzas and the buffalo wings and the beer and the Cokes. Um, this is the real issue. I wish somebody had told me the effect of these kind of foods on the human body. Really, really, what happens when you eat them? 
Well, I'm going to share that with you. Let's take a little walk through some basic digestive physiology here. When you eat a meal like you've just had, or one that's up here, you have a nice big green salad, a hearty bowl of vegetable soup, or bean chili like you just had. Here's what, quinoa and zucchini bows. Here's some steamed greens and yellow vegetables. You have a meal like this. And an hour later, well, now it's gotten out into your bloodstream, and an hour later, I sneak up on you with a needle and a syringe in my hand. And when you're not looking, I draw five cc's of blood into a red top tube and let it sit there for an hour and then spin it down in the centrifuge. What you're gonna see is a blood tube that looks like this. The red clot goes to the bottom, the liquid part of the blood, the serum rises to the top. And the serum should be crystal clear. You can read newsprint through normal serum. This is what your blood should look like after you eat a a meal, and it does after a nice, healthy, plant-based meal. But you eat a meal like this, you have bacon and eggs or an egg McMuffin for breakfast, you have lunch with burgers, fries, and a shake, you have a, a pizza, steak, fried chicken, and fries. You have a meal like this. And an hour later, I sneak up on you with that syringe and draw that five cc's of blood, let it clot, spin it down. What you see is a blood tube that looks like this. This creamy appearance here, this is fat in the blood. We are talking, of course, about a postprandial after eating lipemia, it means fat in the blood. Now, granted, not everybody shows it this optically densely, but everybody has a wave of fat that goes to the bloodstream after you eat a fatty meal like this. How can you not? Where is it going to go? Of course, your blood turns fatty. And your blood runs thick with fat for five, count them, five hours. <clears throat> Seriously. Here's Kuo's classic study. They give someone a fatty meal at hour zero, and they draw blood once an hour for six hours. They take those six blood tubes, put them one after another into a spectrophotometer to see how fatty the blood is getting, and you can see the blood getting fattier and fattier and fattier and fattier. It takes the liver about five hours to begin to clear the fat out of the blood. Well, this is not a good thing, because in those five hours, evil things are happening in the body. The endothelial lining of the arteries is being injured by the saturated fats and uh, everything else in the, the, the phosphoric acid and from the cola drinks, the high fructose corn syrup, but the, the fat in the blood, uh, the saturated fat is inflammatory and it, and it inflames the endothelial lining of the arteries. Uh, as the fat flows through the abdominal fat stores, it sticks there, increasing obesity. The fat infiltrates into the muscle and liver cells, interfering with glucose transport and make people insulin resistant. And contrary to what you may have heard, saturated fats are not benign. They are pro-inflammatory, and, and a wave of saturated fats fans inflammatory reactions throughout the body. So why is this important? Well, think of how most people run their eating day in this day and age in this country. They start the morning off with something fatty, and for the next five hours, their blood is fatty, their arteries are getting injured, their obesity is increasing, their insulin resistance is getting worse, and inflammation is increasing. It takes the liver till about noontime to begin to clear the breakfast fat out of the blood when time for lunch. And another wave of fat goes to the bloodstream, and all afternoon, the arteries are getting injured, the fat stores are increasing, the insulin resistance is going up, the inflammation is getting fanned. It takes the liver till about six in the evening to begin to clear the lunchtime fat out of the blood when time to visit the colonel and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream. And all evening, the arteries are getting injured, more, uh, more insulin resistance happening, more obesity. It takes the liver till about 10 at night to begin to clear the dinnertime fat out of the blood when on the way back to the bedroom, you polish off that half pint of haagen in the freezer, and people go to bed like this. And the truth is, when you open the door in that waiting room, in the emergency room, or your outpatient clinic, or a surgical OPD, most of the people sitting there are keeping their blood fatty all day. Stuff never clears out of the bloodstream. You keep your blood fatty 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you can't be shocked when some abnormal changes start showing up in the body. Now, I'm using fat as an example here, but it's not a matter of eating a low-fat diet. The fat's just a marker for what's happening in that bloodstream. The truth is there is an evil brew of molecules flowing through that blood while it's all fatty, 
from the last meal. What are the problematic substances? Well, salt is certainly one of them. This is a high sodium diet we eat in America these days. Uh, I was just in Israel. This is hummus and falafel. They're pretty salty. Cheese is very salty. You don't want to eat unsalted cheese. It's unpalatable. The french fries are full of salt. The chips are full of salt. It's a high salt diet. What's the problem? Well, the sodium ions infiltrate into the wall of the arteries and stiffens them. The arteries lose that lovely compliance that absorbs the shock waves from the ventricular contraction. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the kidneys will retain fluid to dilute out the salt in between the stiff arteries and the increased uh, intervascular volume. Blood pressure goes up. Um, but we're finding out the sodium is not benign uh, on an immunological level. Um, high salt diets stimulate the T17 helper cells, uh, which opens the door to autoimmune diseases like lupus and ankylosing spondylitis. High salt diets are not healthy for you. Then there's sugar. Now, I'm not talking about a half a teaspoon of maple syrup in your tea. That's an appropriate use of sweeteners as a flavoring. It's a sweet flavoring. That's okay. What I'm talking about is eating sugar as a food. You don't want to eat sugar as a food. And when you're scoffing down the chocolate chip cookies and the devil's food cake and the candy bars and the donuts and drinking the cola drink, you're eating sugar as a food. Hundreds of grams of fructose and glucose flood through your tissues. What's so bad about that? Well, they, they like spilling maple syrup on the kitchen table, it gets sticky. It sticks to proteins all over your body. You wind up glycosylating important proteins, the collagen in your connective tissue, the hemoglobin in your blood. Uh, this is not a good thing to make your proteins all sticky with sugar. Why not? Because of a reaction you may have learned about in biochemistry called the Maillard reaction. Every baker knows the Maillard reaction. Uh, Maillard says uh, that uh, sugars plus protein plus heat uh, creates a very distinctive result. In the bakery, the sugar is the pastry flour, the protein is the gluten, and the heat is in the oven. And um, the, the, the sugars stick to the protein, the heat then oxidizes this glycosylated protein mass into this, this morass of, of oxidized, matted, bastardized tissues. Um, the chemists call it advanced glycation end products. It's what causes the crust on the bread. And that's fine on the surface of a French baguette. But you don't want to run the Maillard reaction in the lens of your eye, that's a great way to open the door to cataracts. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction in the elastin fibers of your skin. It's a great way to wind up with an epidermis that looks like an old suitcase. And you don't want to run the, the Maillard reaction in the inner lining of the blood vessels that brings oxygen to your brain. Uh, when we analyze the brains of folks with Alzheimer's disease, that we find they are loaded with advanced glycation end products. The acronym is appropriate, uh, AGEs, um, eating sugar as a food ages you, and you don't want to eat sugar as a food. But again, your patients are doing this, and it's one reason they wind up with so many dysfunctional function or reactions in their body. So we're talking about problems with uh, too much fat in the blood, too much sugar in the blood, too much salt in the blood. Now you can do all of those damaging maneuvers uh, to yourself uh, by eating uh, vegan junk foods, vegan cookies and cakes and, and colas, etc. cetera. Um, don't have any animal products and, uh, and even the vegetable oil in the fries, you don't wanna be eating that stuff, especially if it's been heated in the fryer there. Um, and so it's not just a matter of avoiding animal products, it's not uh, doing the vegan junk foods. You know, you, it's okay, you know, those impossible burgers taste great. And, and once a month as a treat, that's okay. But man, you don't want to be eating those things on a regular basis because it sets off some evil reactions in your body. So these are plant-based threats to your health that you want to avoid. But you've heard a lot, I'm sure, in this nutrition and medicine course about plant-based nutrition. Why, are we, why is that being advocated? Well, let's take the microscope and let's tune it in to our bodies when we actually eat meat, when we actually eat animal muscle, what really happens and why is it not a good idea as far as I'm concerned and a whole lot of other folks. Let's talk about the realities. Nobody eats raw animal muscle. It's all cooked, it's grilled, it's fried, baked. 
Every animal muscle cell, as you learned in histology, and the cell membrane has cholesterol. And so that chicken breast that's put under the grill um, has lots of cholesterol. And under that hot uh, flame or on the barbecue, etc., uh, that cholesterol gets oxidized. And you wind up with a whole load of oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol particles are highly atherogenic. And it's the oxidized LDL particles, that this is the wall of the artery, that work their way into the wall of the artery, set off the inflammatory reaction that summons in the macrophages, that turns them into foam cells, that, uh, <clears throat> that sets off uh, the cascade of uh, uh, reactions that lead to atherosclerotic plaque, which ruptures, sets off the clot uh, that causes the stroke or heart attack. And it's the oxidized cholesterol is the initial particle that sets it off. And every time you're eating foods like this, you're sending a flood of oxidized cholesterol particles through your bloodstream. The very act of cooking that meat or grilling that steak or that chicken oxidizes a whole lot of nucleic acids and proteins. And as a result, you create a whole slew of reactive aldehydes, malonaldehyde, glyoxyl, acrolein. These are nasty molecules, small but vicious, because they are mutagenic. And that means they damage your genes. And these are genes that turn on important enzymes. These are genes that may set off reactions like oncogenes that uh, fan malignant growth. Uh, you don't want to mess up your genes with a bunch of reactive aldehydes. And every burger and, uh, uh, and chicken breast and buffalo wing uh, sends a flood of that through your bloodstream. Then there's good old new 5GC. Ever hear of it? I hadn't uh, until a few years ago. New 5GC is a sialic acid, it looks like this, and only animals make it. And this is highly inflammatory. If you stain for it, you'll find new 5GC in the uh, coronary artery lesions, in the panis of rheumatoid arthritic joints. And uh, our paleo friends and our keto friends are giving themselves a shot of new 5GC two, three times a day with every meal. Uh, this is a great way to uh, set off all sorts of inflammatory reactions in the body. And then there's good old endotoxin. This is nasty stuff. If any of you, uh, well, you haven't spent time in the intensive care unit yet, but you will, and you're gonna run into a dreadful, f f widely feared entity called endotoxic shock. This is uh, when the bacteria in the gut get out in the bloodstream and release uh, endotoxin. It shuts down organs, uh, causes massive vasodilation, kills patients. It's a common uh, cause of death in the intensive care unit. Well, where does endotoxin comes from? Glad you all ate your plant-based meal, and endotoxin comes from the slaughterhouse. Uh, <clears throat> every animal uh, that is eaten passes through the slaughterhouse, even organic grass-fed beef and, uh, and kosher slaughtered beef. They all wind up in the slaughterhouse. Um, and when the animal um, is, uh, has its throat cut and is hung up on the rack, it is eviscerated. And when the GI system is removed from the carcass, the gut bacteria spill out. And as a result, you can go to every cutting surface in the slaughterhouse, and if you have a culture tube, you can take a swipe and culture Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli, Enterococcus, uh, the whole parade of, of nasty entero, um, enteric bacteria. What, so, so what? What happens? Well, that means that every steak and every chop and every chicken breast that's been laid on this cutting surface has a film of these enteric bacteria on the surface. It's then wrapped in cellophane and uh, sent to the uh, meat market, uh, sent to the supermarket, where in the meat case, it sits under the ultraviolet light that shine down. Why? To kill bacteria, and it does. And as a result, these bacteria die. And when they do, their cell walls break apart, and that releases this nasty lipopolysaccharide called endotoxin. This is bad stuff. You want to know what endotoxin does? Take a little walk around this daisy of death and you'll see what endotoxin does. Uh, <clears throat> releases a slew of free radicals, uh, depresses your myocardium, releases histamine, releases tumor necrosis factors, sets off blood clotting, nasty stuff, endotoxin. And it's heat stable. Cooking the burger does not get rid of the endotoxin. Grilling the chicken does not get rid of the endotoxin. And our paleo friends and our keto friends are to give themselves a shot at endotoxin two, three times a day as well. And they're going to find out the hard way that that makes your gut leaky. It, it uh, increases the intestinal permeability. And that allows food proteins and the cell walls of bacteria to leak into the bloodstream. 
and flow through important tissues uh, throughout the body, including your joint membrane, setting off inflammatory arthritis, uh, flowing through immune cells, uh, setting off autoimmune diseases, nasty stuff, endotoxin. Then the parade continues uh, to TMAO. What is that? Well, as we're all learning about the microbiome, <clears throat> the food you eat determines the microbes that live in your gut. If you eat a bunch of sugar, you're going to summon up sugar-eating microbes. Well, you eat a diet based on meat and eggs, then you are dropping down big bolts of carnitine and choline down into your gut. And what's that going to do? It's going to summon up a population of microbes that eat choline and carnitine. They have names like Pepstreptococci and Clostridia. And they don't care about you. They're waiting for that next chicken breast or salmon steak to come down. And they will metabolize the carnitine and choline into trimethylamine that your liver then oxidizes into trimethylamine oxide. This is a molecule from hell. This drives cholesterol into the artery walls and prevents HDL from pulling, uh, doing the reverse tr uh, transport of pulling the cholesterol out of the artery walls. And there's already studies showing up in the literature that the long-term paleo eaters uh, have significantly elevated TMAO concentrations. And the reports are coming in of these, these fit-looking guys with the ripped six-pack abs dropping dead on the treadmill at age 49. And when they do the autopsy, they go, oh, he looks so healthy. But in, look at his arteries. You're as old as your arteries. <clears throat> and inside, <clears throat> he transformed himself into an old, old man. Uh, from uh, this flesh-based diet. TMAO <clears throat> had a major role to play. The very active cooking animal muscle is going to uh, oxidize a whole lot of proteins uh, that result in a family of carcinogenic heterocyclic amines. These set off cancers uh, on any tissues that they rub against. And <clears throat> again, the meat-based folks, meat-based eaters, uh, wind up with higher, uh, much higher incidence of gastric cancers as, the, uh, as these carcinogens rub against the uh, stomach wall. But also because there's no fiber in meat, these folks are often semi-constipated. It takes a long time for the fecal masses uh, to move through the colon. They're covered with carcinogens. And so they've got a long time, a long exposure time to rub against the descending colon. Uh, and it's no accident that these folks sprout out uh, carcinomas of the colon in the descending and sigmoid colon. Um, uh, again, the uh, meat eaters find this one out the hard way. Then there's heme iron. What's that? That's, of course, the iron that's attached to hemoglobin. And uh, the red meat eaters so wind up eating a lot of this, and so do the chicken eaters. Uh, what's the problem? Well, iron's essential in small amounts uh, so your bone marrow can make your red cells. But lots of iron is to be avoided. Iron, if, if you looked at a rusting car bumper, iron is a pro-oxidant. And uh, when you've got iron overload in your body, uh, then you're at higher risk for strokes and, and GI cancers as well. And the problem with the heme iron, the, the bodybuilder, oh, give me that steak, man, I want that iron. The problem's this. We need iron, but there's plenty of iron in plant foods. I, mean, I don't know if you remember Popeye, who, who ate his spinach, for you to get the iron there. There's iron in dark leafy greens, there's iron in dried fruits and raisins and apricots. There's iron in, in plant foods. But it's non-heme iron, and that's good because your gut, your, your intestinal lining, if your iron stores in your bone marrow are full and replete, you've got plenty of iron, your gut wall can keep non-heme iron out. But not so with heme iron. Nothing stops it. It just leaps into the bloodstream. And the, these guys who are eating red steak after lamb chop are giving themselves iron overload because us guys, we can't get rid of iron. And postmenopausal women can't get rid of iron. So it's no bargain to be loading yourself up with heme iron. And then finally, the animals in the feedlot are fed bushels of grains that have been sprayed with herbicides and pesticides and antibiotics and growth promoters. These are fat-soluble substances. And as the weeks go by in the feedlot, these, the pesticides and herbicides are accumulating, they're bioaccumulating in the animal's flesh. And what makes that chicken so finger-licking good is the amount of fat in, that is in those muscles uh, of those birds. And, and the fat is where these uh, bioaccumulated uh, toxins accumulate. 
uh, the, uh, the, the water in the feedlots usually not the best. There's often heavy metals, mercury, lead, cadmium, and that winds up in the animal flesh as well. So that burger uh, or, or that lamb chop or that steak, mm, maybe not such a great nutritional bargain when you realize the load of, uh, of threatening molecules that it uh, contains. Well, I just won't eat that meat, I'll eat fish. Well, we've been treating the oceans like sewers, and uh, most of the large game fish now are re replete, redolent, um, with mercury and pesticides and dioxins and now microplastins. And so this now focuses a very sharp lens on our food, on your patient's food, and the nutritional advice you are dispensing. It presents the question to the clinician, you, does your patient's blood carry these molecules meal after meal, day after day, or doesn't it? Because if you are acquiescing to the standard Western diet, and especially if you are promoting a paleo diet, a keto diet, you are telling your patients, it's good for you. I want you to keep these molecules percolating through every tissue in your body, your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your bone marrow, meal after meal, hour after hour, day after week after week, month after month. You just keep this stuff in your bloodstream pretty much constantly. <clears throat> I will remind you that uh, in Arizona, the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon day after day after day after day. This is the power of persistence. And if you're telling your patient, yep, I want you to keep these molecules in your blood, we'll eat that meat, keep the, these molecules in your bloodstream and through your tissues pretty much constantly, then we're shocked when, the, when tissues become inflamed in the body. We're puzzled why the, why the arteries started getting inflamed and, and growing atherosclerotic plaque. We're, we're mystified why the gut has gotten leaky from all the bacteria that have been spawned there and all the endotoxin and, and autoimmune disease comes from that. Gee, we're puzzled where that lupus came from. And gee, that, that, sorry about that colon cancer you sprouted out. I don't know what, bad gene, it must have been bad genetics. We play, we practice medicine like what our patients are eating has no effect on these diseases. As scientists, how can we do that with a straight face? How can we ignore this very, very powerful disruptive influence uh, that our patients are subjecting to themselves on a daily basis with our blessing upon our directions? Now, the question is, does your patients, uh, when they're sitting in front of you, clogged up and inflamed and diabetic and hypertensive, and you can't figure out why, you know, I asked, is your patient carrying this stuff in his bloodstream meal after meal? If the patient is eating a plant-based diet, the answer is no. My patient, no, he ain't doing that to himself, thank you. And when we're advocating plant-based diets, one reason is they will stop this onslaught uh, of these very toxic molecules. <clears throat> and I've, I'm afraid that our paleo friends and patients and family members are going to find this out the hard way. Now, when people adopt these diets, they often improve initially. And there are, there are lots of reports, lots of anecdotes. Oh, my, I want a paleo diet, man, I lost weight. My lipids got better, I feel better. And yay, paleo. And I'll grant that happens. The paleo folks say, listen, no, no caveman ever milked a dairy cow. So they're down on dairy products. Yay, paleo, they're right. No, no caveman ever squeezed the fat out of olives and poured it on a salad. Get, they're down on oils. That's a good idea. Yay. And they say no caveman ever ground wheat into flour and made donuts and coffee cakes, so they're down on flour products. Yay, paleo. They're right. And uh, you eliminate the dairy and the oils and the flours from somebody's diet, then most folks are going to trim down. And the weight loss is going to do good things in their body. And their lipids are going to get better, and their insulin resistance is going to get better. And yay, your improvement. And the, see, paleo is the best way to eat, man. People get better. My suggestion as an experienced clinician with a few gray hairs here, don't be seduced by these early changes. That's mostly from the weight loss and from initial improvements in a few organ functions. But the real issue is what are you really brewing up in this patient's colon wall? 
what are you really brewing up in his prostate? What's, what's cooking in this patient's arteries over the long term? What are you really doing in this woman's breast tissue? <clears throat> this is the real concern. What's happening in the patient's brain? Do no harm applies to dietary advice as well. Healthcare is very episodic. You seldom see the same doc in the clinic when you go back and see them. Patients move away, doctors move away, and some young doc will give the oh, you want to eat paleo, you want to eat keto, and you don't see him again. But the patient follows that advice. And month after month, year after year, is packing their intestines with meat and running these toxins through their bloodstream. And I would say to that young doc who dispensed this drive-by dietary advice, you're going to be around in 10 years when that patient first passes his first bloody stool from the colon cancer that your diet cooked up in his colon. Well, you won't be around to see it. You're going to be around in 15 years. This lady has her stroke from that carotid plaque that, uh, that your highly inflammatory diet cooked up in her artery. You're going to be around uh, in 20 years when the Alzheimer's first starts setting in from the vascular disease. I'll show you what Alzheimer's brains look like as far as their blood vessels. You won't be around to see it. And this is the danger of this kind of dietary advice. And so you young practitioners, again, take a step back about what you're really saying to these patients. Do you really know what you're doing? Do you know what you are saying to these patients? And what effect are you really producing in their body? Do no harm is, uh, really is important uh, advice here. <clears throat> so. Um, the problem that I fear is that the paleo eaters may be setting themselves up for an epidemic of colon cancer and heart attacks and strokes and autoimmune diseases and diabetes and inflammatory bowel disease, the colitis and the Crohn's disease and dementia. This, I fear, is the real result of these flesh-based diets. We are not carnivorous apes. We evolved on this planet up through the simian line. The, the apes family have been on this planet for 20 million years. And they were basically plant-eating creatures. We got fingers on our hands, not claws. We got big, long intestines for digesting fiber. We've got uh, saliva that has starch digesting am amylase, not protein digesting uh, proteases. We're basically plant-eating creatures. Yes, we can scavenge a little flesh from time to time for survival reasons, but we were never meant to eat a flesh-based diet. And when we, uh, we don't have the same system as, your, as mountain lions and house cats. And when we do, uh, we wind up with, uh, when we try and eat that kind of food, we wind up with some bad diseases, to say the least. And nobody's eaten these kind of diets for, for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, this is all new theoretical stuff out of somebody's best-selling textbook, somebody's best-selling New York Times best-selling book. But nobody's eaten paleo diets or ketogenic diets or kept themselves in ketosis for 20 years. This is bizarre. No, this is terribly unphysiologic. That's like driving your car to Seattle in passing gear. The, the, this is a stressful, stressful state. And these folks don't know what they're saying when they advocate it. Being in ketosis from time to time is a good thing. When I worked at the center, we did water fasting. And, uh, and just drinking water for four or five days, uh, you burn through your blood sugar, you're in a state of ketosis, not from eating flesh, but from drinking water. And the body shifts into this amazing gear of conservation and rebalancing and, and autophagy, where it starts cleaning up cellular debris. Good thing to be in ketosis for a few days, once a month, or a couple of times, you know, once every couple of months. That's fine. But to stay in ketosis week after week after week after week, um, this is stressful on the body. This is hard on the liver and the kidneys and the bones. We won't go into all the physiology, but they don't know really what they're talking about here. It's, uh, our gorilla and bonobo cousins are up in the trees tonight eating leaves and fruits because that's their natural diet. And that's basically what we should be eating as well, a plant-based diet. Nobody's eaten these kind of diets for decades, but people have eaten plant-based diets for a long time. And if you check out the blue zones where the most centenarians live, now you find that, they're, that all of them are eating largely plant-based diets. None of them are completely vegan. There's a little fish here and there. But the vast majority of what goes down their gullets grew out of the ground, and we should take a lesson from that. But we don't. We practice medicine like what our patients are eating. Yes, no effect on these diseases. It's just an appalling, uh, grotesque deficiency in medical education. And it overlooks a basic 
fact of physiology. Within minutes of eating anything, molecules of that food are flowing through every cell in your body where your DNA lies unfolded. And the food molecules wash across your DNA and they play your DNA like a piano. And they turn genes on, they turn genes off. They turn enzymes on, they shut enzymes down. Every meal changes you on a genetic molecular level. We cannot overlook that and the consequences are obvious. You don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes are going to be turned on by this flesh food and all the contaminating molecules that it contains as it washes across your DNA, setting off everything from aging to autoimmunity to cancer. The genes are going to be turned on by this substance are going to be a completely different set of genes than are going to be turned on by this food that, that sends a surge of phytonutrients through your tissues, the polyphenols and the sulforaphanes, that are stabilizing. They're antioxidants. They quench free radicals. They promote tissue repair. They give the chemical message to your tissues, shh, everything's okay. It's the difference between one and zero, a flesh-based meal or a plant-based meal. It, it has, they have completely different effects in your body. And we can't pretend, as you say, oh, eat paleo, eat keto, eat meat three times a day. We can't pretend that it doesn't have profound uh, consequences on genetic and molecular levels. Your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pull the trigger. You may, you may have a genetic propensity to develop diabetes or colon cancer, but whether that disease actually manifests in your body depends largely upon the molecules you're flushing through it on a daily basis. And, and we can't pretend this doesn't happen. Here you see it in action. <clears throat> this is a genetic readout of a, of man, a biopsy of a man with prostate cancer. And this is early stage prostate cancer and all these little red patches here, these are active oncogenes that have been turned on that promote cancer growth. Uh, they put this man on a whole food plant-based diet and salad after steamed greens after a vegetable soup washed through his prostate for six months. And then they re-biopsied him, same guy, same prostate gland, but look at the difference. These oncogenes have been silenced by the food that's been flowing through this man's prostate. Every meal changes us. We can't pretend this isn't happening. This doesn't happen. It's such a powerful mechanism. Food changes you in one of two ways. It either changes you directly, uh, epigenetically, the way a new 5GC turns on inflammation, but also we have to keep in mind food changes the microbes in our gut, and they will change you uh, because they are not passive bystanders. Their byproducts are serotonin and norepinephrine and... Uh, and uh, uh, dopamine, uh, they put out neurotransmitters that get into our brains and change our mood, change our perception. Food changes us. It is so powerful. And yet we blow right past it uh, when in medical education, except here. Uh, that's why nutrition and medicine is so key. Because to practice medicine without regard for what your patient's eating puts you in the position of the blind man and the elephants. And you all remember the fable where the blind men uh, stumble upon an elephant, each grabs a different part, and uh, uh, one's got the tail, the elephant's, he thinks the elephant's like a rope, one grabs the trunk, the elephant's like a snake, one grabs the, the leg, the elephant's like a tree trunk. They all have hold of the same elephant, but none of them has the faintest clue what the whole elephant really is. Well, that's the predicament of the physician who practices without nutritional awareness, and especially the specialists, those poor, wonderful folks in their cubicles trying to decipher um, the, their particular pet diseases. <clears throat> the cardiologist sees the clogged arteries, and the internist sees the high blood pressure, and the endocrinologist sees the type 2 diabetes, and the physiatrist sees the sore joints, and the rheumatologist sees the lupus. And the neurologist sees the stroke, and the dermatologist sees the psoriasis, and the gastroenterologist sees the Crohn's and the colitis, and the general surgeon sees the colon cancer. And they're all trying to figure out their, their own separate disease. What could this be? And now they're realizing that, they're, ooh, there's some commonalities. Gee, they all 
They're all their diseases have something to do with inflammation and something to do with oxidative stress uh, and, and something to do with free radicals. Hmm, where could they be coming from? I would like to sneak into their cubicles and yell smartly into their ear, it's the food that your patients are eating is supplying these disruptive substances. Because without letting that in the door, the, 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 it reduces the specialist to just given, uh, raising their metformin dosage and increasing their statin dose and come back in a month and let's see if you're doing any better because they're not getting the root of the disease. And the real victim of this, of course, is the patient because, as I'm going to be showing you, you put this person on a real live human diet based of whole plant foods and you run these through their tissues meal after meal and these diseases go away. And one of the most important concepts you can learn at this time in your medical career is disease reversal. I practiced medicine for 45 years before anybody put these two words in the same sentence for me. It didn't dawn on me that these are reversible diseases. High blood pressure is reversible. Diabetes is reversible, type 2. What, is, what are we talking about? We're talking about remission of clinical symptoms, the, the joints stop hurting, the lungs stop wheezing, and also the lab tests revert to normal. This is reversal of disease. This is so important for two people, you and the patient. You need to know this. You need to know that these are reversible diseases. And as you go through your clinical rotations with two, with, and there's unenlightened professors, um, and they will tell you, all you can do is just raise your metformin dosage and increase your statins. You need to know these reversible diseases. Whether you say anything to that professor or not, when you get out and practice, know that these are reversible diseases and you owe it to the patient. And the patient needs to know these reversible diseases. You mean I don't have to have diabetes the rest of my life? No, you don't. We can reverse that. You can reverse that. I don't have to have high blood pressure. No, you don't have to. Um, you can reverse these diseases with a whole food, plant-based diet and proper lifestyle changes. They've got to stop smoking and, and get enough rest. But what are we talking about? We're talking about the foods you already eat, a breakfast of fruit and oatmeal, or just fruit, or just water if you're not hungry. Just drink water until you get hungry. And lunches and dinners are big colorful salads and hearty vegetable soups and big plates of green and yellow vegetables and lovely vegetable stir fries and, and lentil stews and, um, and bean chilies and, uh, and some dark bread if you want, uh, too much of that, uh, and fruits for dessert. And you can do any cuisine you want, Mexican, Italian, East Indian, Chinese, doesn't matter, have fun with the spices. And you can eat all you want. Um, this is, it's mostly fiber and water. It doesn't stick to you. If you go back for a fourth bowl of vegetable soup, who cares? It's, ve it's vegetable soup. It doesn't stick to you. And so this is joyous eating. There's no calorie counting, no portion control. I mean, how many apples can you eat? I, how, you know, how much salad can you eat? Uh, eat till your stomach gets full. And, and as I said, it's more, the calorie density is so low that people get lean and healthy. Why do they get leaner and healthier? They get leaner, as I said, the calorie density is low, but they get healthier because going from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet changes everything, literally. Uh, I'm going to show you, it's kind of a busy slide, but if you don't, don't let your eyes glaze over, you'll see some familiar um, uh, patterns here. Uh, what happens when you go from, a plant, from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet? Well, first of all, here's that uh, grim um, hall of shame of, the, uh, of these molecular threats in the meat. They're all of a sudden gone, poof. The, uh, the chemical onslaught has stopped. All the inflammatory toxins that were flushed into the tissues, poof, they're gone. And instead, you eat, eat, are eating high, plant, high uh, amount of plant foods that have a high water content. So you're flushing lots of water through the tissues, and that water is carrying all these lovely antioxidants and phytonutrients that are stabilizing uh, and promote tissue repair. And that starts changing everything in the body. It changes the blood viscosity. The blood is less thick, and it flows more easily through the tissues. The oxygen delivery improves to all the tissues. Uh, uh, meat contains arachidonic acid. This is the precursor of prostaglandin 2 that is an inflammatory mediator. Well, that markedly decreases 
and it's replaced by these omega-3 fats that turn into prostaglandin 1 and 3 that are anti-inflammatory. So inflammation subsides throughout the body. You've stopped the fried meats and cooked animal proteins, so oxidative stress decreases in the body. It changes the microbes in your gut. All these plant foods, all the rice and beans and resistant starches and plant fibers, promotes the growth of good Firmicutes bacteria and suppresses the, the pathogenic bacteroides in the gut. Um, and this, in turn, often improves people's emotional state. People often feel better as they adopt plant-based diets. Skin oils change. The, the texture, the quality of the skin oils has a lot to do with the fats that you're eating. And if the majority of your fats are heavy saturated meat fats and dairy fats, then you wind up with thicker skin oils. Um, they're more inflammatory. They clog up oil glands that set off acne. Well, that changes. I mean, the plant oils are much less viscous. Uh, and we often see acne get better, psoriasis gets better, skin improves with this. Uh, um, the cows are all pregnant and in the dairies now, and so the milk is full of estrogens that uh, give women breast lumps and, and fibroids and make little girls go through puberty at age eight and give guys prostate cancer. Um, well, that, phew, get rid of the dairy, and that goes away. Uh, hormone levels balance. Renal function gets better. <clears throat> High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. Let me say that again. High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. When all those amino acids slam into the glomeruli, they force the kidney into what's called hyperfiltration, and this is stressful on the kidney. To keep this kidney in hyperfiltration week after week damages it, damages the stroma, damages the glomeruli. High protein diets are a ticket to the dialysis machine. Well, in, when you take the meat away, the renal function improves. GFRs go up, creatinines go down. Uh, the asthmatic folks wheeze less. The, the quality of the respiratory mucus changes. It's less, in, less inflammatory, less thick. Uh, the, the white cell count drifts down, and that's a good thing. It's a sign that there's less inflammation in the body. Changing from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet changes everything, literally. It's, a, it's like you were trying to run your car on diesel fuel. Now you're putting in gasoline. Boom, runs better. And, uh, and that's what we see. Uh, with whole food plant-based diets. You will see this in the clinic and it's the most inspiring, fulfilling transformation you will see in medicine. With, when you, see, you see patients walking in like this and like Emily with her diabetes and her angina. You get them on a healthy plant-based diet, lots of soups and salads and greens, etc. Within days, the obesity starts to melt away. The arteries open up, the high blood pressure comes down, the joints stop hurting, the skin starts to clear up, the bowels start working, the migraine headaches reduce or go away, the asthmatic lungs stop wheezing. They turn into normal, healthy people right in front of your eyes. It, they are the most grateful, appreciative, and healthy people. And what more could you ask? In medicine. Isn't this why we go into medicine? What greater gift can you bestow upon your patient to let them earn a body uh, from this Emily, 11 months on a plant-based diet, turn into this Emily? Isn't that the highest thing in medicine that we, that we can do? You, 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 Emily walks in like this, you work with her, 11 months later, you, when she leaves your clinic, you go, yes, good for you, Emily. And then you can look in the mirror and say, good job, doc. Because that's really <laughs> what you're here for. Um, there's a role for acute medicine, and, and again, a bad traffic accident. You want a good orthopedic trauma surgeon, but you know, that's you know, you know, that's a one-time engagement with that person. Here, you know, this is a lifetime transformation. So let's talk about some real science about what really happens here. Let's talk about diabetes. <clears throat> People think diabetes is too much sugar in the, blood, in the body. No, it's, that is not the issue. The issue is fat. Uh, insulin resistance is caused by uh, excessive amount of fat uh, in the tissues. Here's how it works. Uh, this is a muscle cell. Uh, the muscle cells run on glucose. Let me say that again. You learned that in first year physiology. But your mitochondria burn glucose preferentially. You're the Krebs cycle enzymes are looking for glucose, not fat. No matter what the keto folks tell you, we are carbohydrate-burning organisms. Now, you need to move the glucose into the muscle cell. And to do that, insulin has to uh, signal the insulin receptors to allow the glucose in. 
uh, and uh, it's burned in the mitochondria and the muscle cell functions. Yay. But if the person's keeping their blood fatty, meal after meal, day after day, month after month, the fat starts seeping into the muscle cells and into the liver cells. And you wind up <clears throat> in the muscle with intramyocellular lipid. You can see what that word says. It's, it's fat in the muscle cell. This is not theoretical. Let me show you what it looks like. This is striated muscle uh, that's been stained, and this black stuff is intramyocellular lipid. It's fat in the muscle cell that does not belong there. Here it is under the electron microscope. This is intramyocellular lipid, and this is what's causing the insulin resistance. Why? How? Here's why. Here's how. <clears throat> Glucose transport is an active process. Um, the glucose uh, is penocytized uh, into these vesicles, um, and it's brought into the cell because insulin comes along, uh, stimulates the insulin receptors, and, and that activates two kinase enzymes, this K and that K, are two kinase enzymes that allow the glucose to be actively transported into the cell. But when the cell is all loaded up with, with lipid, uh, the lipid oxidizes and that creates a whole lot of free radicals and they wind up paralyzing the kinase enzymes. And so it stops this mechanism. So insulin knocks on the door but nobody answers. And as a result, the sugar winds up uh, increasing in the bloodstream. And people say, oh, the sugar disease, but it's a disease of fat toxicity. Dr. Harvey Shirley in 1930 took a bunch of medical students, gave them a bunch of olive oil and bacon fat, and they all went diabetic. Um, they all went insulin resistant. When they got them on a, on a carbohydrate and a normal diet again, uh, the, the insulin resistance went away. It's absolutely re re reproducible. The keto folks eating these high fat diets are making themselves insulin resistance. But because they eat no glucose, no sugar, ooh, avoid those carbs, their blood sugar curves are flat. And they see, it's a great control of blood sugar. But they're all insulin resistant. If they eat any carbohydrate, that sugar spikes up. And they say, see, those carbs are bad for you. But they've created this abnormal state of insulin resistance. This is not normal. This is not healthy for the body. <laughs> Again, I'm not making this up. If you do searches on uh, uh, intramyocellular lipid and insulin resistance, you'll see uh, there is a strong uh, correlation there. Now, this is made worse by body fat. And we need to talk about fat and obesity. In the space of my medical career, I entered medical practice in 1972, and in the intervening 45 years, I have seen a tsunami of obesity sweep through our society. And it's very disturbing because a lot of diseases are associated with this. And rather than saying something about it, we've normalized it. And it's a delicate subject. And I gave a talk yesterday uh, to USC, and I mentioned this, and I want to say, oh, but the, I, I'm, you're fat shaming uh, my, my patient. I can't mention this to them. Uh, they'll think I'm fat shaming them. And so we let the patient adopt this attitude of, yeah, doc, I know I'm carrying too much body fat. It's OK. <laughs> it's not OK. Not if you want to be healthy. Let's get real about what is inside that big belly. I'll show you a plastic model of an obese abdomen cut in sagittal section. And here's the reality. There's two types of fat making that belly so large. Subcutaneous fat and intra-abdominal fat. The subcutaneous fat is metabolically active. It pumps out estrogen. It is the largest estrogen secreting tissue in the body. If <clears throat> You do not want 30 pounds of estrogen secreting tissue plastered on your abdomen, pumping out estrogens, gives women breast lumps, gives them fibroids, increases cancer growth. Um, not a good thing uh, to have this much of an estrogen source plastered on your abdomen. But inside the abdomen, the intra-abdominal fat wrapped around the viscera um, is, is far more damaging because it produces inflammatory cytokines. And these molecules pump out, um, these, uh, they fan inflammatory reactions throughout the body. This list of uh, conditions are all fanned by inflammation. Uh, and, inf and the cytokines pumped out by the abdominal fat um, foster these type of inflammatory reactions. Having a big abdomen like this is, uh, is like having an alien being in your body. And it's not your friend. 
and, uh, and, and it should not be coddled and fostered you know, in your patients uh, for, for fa uh, fear of fat shaming. Don't shame them, but don't let them be complacent to think that it's okay to go through their lives like this. They are cooking up some bad diseases and it makes their diabetes worse. Here we are back in the muscle cell. The, um, the intramyocellular lipid has functionally clogged up their insulin receptors from the inside, but then these inflammatory cytokines from the abdominal fat interfere with the insulin receptors from the outside, and that's why the obese folks are so prone to developing insulin-resistant type 2 diabetes. This is a reversible disease. Shown clearly, uh, Barnard and other researchers have clearly shown the, uh, uh, took a whole bunch of folks with type 2 diabetes. They're still making insulin, but it's not working uh, at the cellular level. Uh, and they compared uh, the folks on the plant-based diet to the American Diabetic Association diet. And uh, after a year and a half, 74 weeks, um, their weight uh, loss was better, their A1C improvement was better, their LDL improvement was better. People get better on plant-based diets. Uh, and all of us um, uh, have patients like Jim uh, who used to be obese and on 30 units of insulin. And you want a whole food plant-based diet, he dropped that big belly and his insulin resistance goes away. And, uh, and now he's off insulin running marathons. This is what people can do. This is the power of plant foods. And we can't, how can you withhold this information from your diabetic patients? Whether or not they follow it, that's not in your power but you at least need to know that this is a reversible disease. It's not just a matter of giving, uh, upping their metformin and upping their insulin dose. Talk to these people about what's really going on in their body. Um, uh, when you're in that outpatient clinic dealing with your diabetic patients, you're gonna run into one of the most fearsome conditions in medicine as diabetic neuropathy. These people are in hell with burning, unremitting pain in, in their lower extremities. They feel like someone's got a blowtorch on, on their lower legs. Um, and I, I used to run the other way when I had a patient with this uh, coming. I didn't know what to tell them. You give them gabapentin and, and, and hope they don't get too sick from it, but nothing really helps. Because what's really going on, we're now understanding, is that in anatomy class, when you studied peripheral nerves, do you remember the vasonervorum, those tiny little blood vessels that bring blood to the nerve? Well, if your blood is viscous and thick, um, the, the oxygen delivery is uh, decreased to the, to the nerve cells, and this is hypoxic pain that's, uh, that's uh, occurring in the nerves. Well, you get them on a whole food plant-based diet, lots of water, and the, uh, and the vis blood viscosity goes down, and the blood's more free-flowing, and the pain goes away. Here is uh, Milton Crane's uh, landmark study to 21 patients with known diabetes and, uh, and uh, diabetic neuropathy, put them on a low-fat plant-based diet. Uh, <clears throat> complete relief of the nerve pain occurred in 17 and 21 patients in four to 16 days. The pain goes away. Uh, the numbness persisted, but it noticeably improved. To, you've got to be able to know about this and offer this to your patients. They will give anything to have that blowtorch taken off their legs. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, dermatology, uh, acne is, is significantly driven by dairy protein. It turns out that the lactalbumin and the casein uh, um, in dairy protein um, stimulates uh, t the TRC1 gene, which uh, makes a whole lot of IGF-1 flow through the tissues, and that makes the oil glands put out a very acidic oil and, uh, and sets off the uh, acne cascade. Um, and these girls uh, had to pull the dairy, and this one had to pull the soy out of her diet as well. But acne can clear up as well uh, with largely dietary maneuvers. It's more than just benzoyl peroxide uh, on their face at night. Uh, psoriasis often gets better. Uh, and not, uh, you know, it doesn't happen instantly, but the, the plaques often fade away. And the most profound change that a whole food plant-based diet can exert is on the vascular tree. And uh, you folks really need to know this. Most of you, I think, already have seen this, but let's go through it. The biggest killer uh, in America today is um, heart attacks and strokes. Every 30 seconds in this country, someone grabs their chest and falls over with a myocardial infarction. And, uh, and every other one of them dies. 
And well, the only thing the cardiologists tell them is you know, take more statins. And, um, and yet people often get heart attacks with low cholesterol, the cholesterol is uh, of 150. Why? Because, as the cardiologists are slow to tweak onto, atherosclerotic lesions do not develop on the wall of the arteries just because your LDL is high. These are inflammatory lesions. These arteries are being injured. Meal after meal of fried animal protein and vegetable oil from the French fries and the high fructose corn syrup and phosphoric acid from the cola drinks and the, all the preservatives and colorings and flavorings and stabilizers, that chemical onslaught from modern cuisine is injuring the endothelial lining and allowing that oxidized cholesterol from the cooked meat to get into the wall of the artery and set off the plaque formation uh, through this uh, uh, progression that we talked about. Now, as far as the cardiologist goes, this is, this is relentlessly progressive is the word they use. Once, it, once that plaque starts building up, nothing will stop it. The, the statins will slow it down, but it's just a matter of time uh, until they need that stent or they need that bypass. Nonsense. This is a reversible disease. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn uh, reported it uh, in, in the late 1990s. Uh, yeah, and his experience took almost 200 patients with significant coronary artery disease. Most of them had stents. They've already had myocardial infarctions. Uh, and you know, they, he had them rigidly. He met with them frequently. He laid down, this is the food you will eat. And it's largely lots of, uh, well, it's a whole food, plant-based diet. Uh, and during the, he followed them for four years. During that time, of these 200 people eating the standard diet, at least 50 of them would have had some adverse coronary event. Of those 200 folks, essentially none of them had any cardiac event, including heart attack, stroke, or death. And angina, that crushing chest pain when you walk because the arteries can't deliver oxygen to the, uh, to the muscles. Angina improved or resolved in 93% of the angina goes away. Of the 21 folks who dropped out and reverted to the standard Western diet, uh, over half of them experienced an adverse event. If you're not familiar with uh, Dr. Esselstyn's work, and especially if you've got patients, tell them to read this book. If, you, if your dad has, has coronary artery disease, get this book and have him follow the directions for uh, assiduously, and he'll benefit. Here's why it works. Dr. Esselstyn has his folks uh, in the morning uh, steam up a bunch of kale or broccoli or, or chard, uh, dark leafy greens, and he has them spray a little balsamic vinegar on it uh, to activate the enzymes that release nitric oxide that dilates blood vessels, and he has them eat three or four or five helpings a day. Every time they're walking through the kitchen, they have a couple of mouthfuls of, uh, of these dark greens. Why? because they're full of antioxidants like resveratrol. And as the weeks go by, and there's a steady level of these antioxidant molecules in the bloodstream, they start seeping into the wall of the arteries. And the antioxidants neutralize the free radicals, the reactive oxygen species, these are free radicals that the foam cells uh, are engulfing. Well, you've taken, taken the meat out of the diet, you've neutralized the free radicals, and consequently, the foam cells that make up the plaque, they leave, they outmigrate. And you see it, the plaques get smaller and smaller and smaller, and the damaged endothelial lining reestablishes itself, not by magic, but because your bone marrow is constantly putting out showers of stem cells that reupholster the arteries and turn them back into, uh, into new arteries. And the result is, you wind up with arteriograms that look like this. <clears throat> this is the left anterior descending artery in the heart of a 46-year-old surgeon, one of Dr. Russellston's colleagues. And uh, here's the artery. It's filled with uh, angiographic dye. And the whole artery should be this thick and pretty much going down. But you see uh, this from this segment down. You see this, this rat-eaten uh, part of the dye column. These are plaques encroaching uh, into, the, into the artery blood flow channel. Uh, this man had such severe angina, he couldn't walk more than 10 yards without getting crushing chest pain and having to take a nitroglycerin. Went on Dr. Esselstyn's plan and eating those dark leafy greens were pretty constantly. 22 months later, the plaques melt down and this artery turns into, <clears throat> turns into this artery. Same patient, same artery. Okay? 
these plaques melt away. This is a reversible disease. How dare we withhold this information from our patient? Just to raise their statin dose and say, you, you need to see the interventional cardiologist for a stent, uh, when this is happening in all the blood vessels in our body, um, is really deficient medicine as far as I can, can, I'm concerned. Here's a myocardial perfusion scan. You want, it should look nice and red. As, uh, this, in, this is blood flow in, through the heart muscle. Uh, but the vessels were all clamped down from the prostaglandins and the meat, et cetera. Uh, when on a whole food plant-based diet, two weeks later, this perfusion scan turns into that perfusion scan. It's that powerful. And arteries all over the body open up, <laughs> much to the delight of uh, people at home. And, uh, and I mentioned Alzheimer's. This is, um, these patients were the same age. This patient did not have Alzheimer's, this did. You can, these are the middle cerebral arteries in their brains. You can see how much of an arterial disease uh, Alzheimer's is. Uh, and uh, most of the risk factors with Alzheimer's are related to meat and the diet. So why aren't you taught about this? Why wasn't I taught about this? You are being taught about it. Most doctors aren't, why not? First of all, it's just not in the curriculum. Medical schools do not value nutrition, uh, and it, just, it simply isn't taught. Uh, they, uh, there's never been any studies that show that diet makes any difference in pick your disease. And the truth is it makes a big difference in all of them. Second, nutrition is not valued. It's a, it's a sissy science. It's a, the dietitians take care of that. I'm up on the OR doing real medicine. I'm doing surgery, man. I'm doing cardiology. Send them to the dietitian. You give them a diet. Don't bother me. <laughs> and and, and they, besides, they don't ask about it on the national board exams. But I'm doing, up on the OR doing real medicine. And for that little piece of arrogant dismissal, that erstwhile young surgeon or erstwhile young cardiologist is going to spend the rest of his career up in the operating room at 3 in the morning or in the cath lab at 4 in the morning dealing with the infections and the infarctions and the amputations from what their patients are eating. They're going to be dealing with nutrition-based diseases their whole career that could be reversed in the outpatient clinic with a referral to the plant-based dietitian. And the third reason why nutrition isn't taught in medical school is that doctors are eating the same crap themselves. And they're eating their burgers and their, and their pizzas and their steaks and their lobsters. And I can tell their patients not to eat it. And then you wind up with that sad spectacle of the obese doctor with a pocket full of statins and lisinopril. Um, that's a heck of an example to set as you walk into the patient's exam room. And I predict just a matter of time before an angry widow walks into the office of a cardiologist or a cardiothoracic surgeon says, my husband died on that operating table last month during that four-vessel bypass, and nobody told us that he could have melted those plaques away from the inside with a plant-based diet. Why didn't somebody tell us this? Why was this information withheld from us? When did you people know this? How long has this been in the medical literature? 25 years. She should call a lawyer and lodge a wrongful death suit. This is a wrongful death. These are all wrongful deaths. Real people are dying on real operating tables from diseases they don't need that could be reversed with applied nutrition. That's why you're taking this blessed course, nutrition in medicine. It is not a, a little fringe uh, side channel of, of interest. This is the core of reversing diseases. Now, some folks may say, well, show me the, I want, I want to see 500 studies with 10,000 patients each, uh, double-blind placebo-controlled studies uh, before I'll believe any of this stuff. And I, I get to the folks with the folded arms in the back of the room uh, demanding that. You're not going to get those kind of studies. Nutrition doesn't lend itself to that. You can't blind the studies. People know what they're eating. And these are long-term effects. You'd have to have a group of patients on the same diet for 25 years to see what happens to their diseases. People, humans don't do that. They change what they eat. Um, if you're really interested in, in analyzing the studies, then uh, go look up the True Health Initiative by Dr. David Katz and learn about the hierarchies of evidence applied to lifestyle medicine, and you'll see how these studies are validated. But, it, but if you're going to insist that uh, the same criteria that they use with the drug studies uh, applied to nutrition, um, you're not going to get what you're looking for. What I'm looking for is real changes in real patients. This is my patient, Ken. 
came in with his wife. The wife had the problem. She was having back pain, uh, and, but she was overweight. And I was telling her what the, Ken I mean, he was, and he was looking around, he was looking at his watch. Uh, he was barely there. But you never know who hears what. And it's not for us to write anybody off, ever. And if they don't hear you the first time, they might hear you the third or fifth time. But Ken comes back, I, I see his wife a few times, the back pain, and her obesity. Um, he, Ken comes back to the office six months later, 25 pounds lighter. Um, <coughs> I was able to get him off his insulin. I got him off his blood pressure pills. Uh, he transformed himself. People never change. They do change. If, you're, if you believe it, if you're excited about it, the patient will pick up on your enthusiasm. So in this era of spiraling health, out of control healthcare costs, I tell the young students and my colleagues, before you order another $1,000 scan, before you order another $500 set of blood tests, stop. Ask your patients what they ate yesterday. Have them take you through their you know, typical eating day. And if it's full of egg McMuffins and burgers and buffalo wings and pepperoni pizzas, that's why they're sitting in front of you, obese and diabetic and hypertensive and inflamed. You know, we've been playing nutrition like in, in the Harry Potter movies, Voldemort, you know, the name that must not be spoken. And they're, mm, don't ask what the patient's eating. We're Americans. We can eat whatever we want. Yeah, but your arteries have something to say about that. Yeah, and prostate has something to say about that. Breast tissue has something to say about that. The colon sure does. Uh, and we can't ignore physical law. You're here learning basic sciences. You're learning the physiology of the gut, of the cardiovascular system. We have to honor that. Uh, as Dr. DeBelba said, the, the, the basic principles of, of osteopathic medicine, the body is a self-healing organism. That if we stop disrupting it and interfering with it, and that means putting it on the diet it was meant to run on. I don't have time to do this, and I don't know anything about it, uh, but I don't have time to counsel my patient. You don't have to, doctor. You, at a minimum, you owe them a handout going out the door. Here's my three-pager that I give patients. You want to get rid of your diabetes. You want to get rid of your high blood pressure. You want to get rid of your colitis here. Run your eating day like this. This will be all available to you. And educate yourself. Go to these websites. Go to Engine 2. Go to Forks Over Knives. Uh, go to Nutrition Facts, uh, see, um, uh, see these films, uh, read these books if you like, educate yourself. <clears throat> and, but most doctors say, listen, uh, it may, maybe so, but I don't know anything about nutrition. I don't have time for this. I don't get paid for this. You don't have to, doctor. All you need to do is recognize that person sitting in front of you with disease X is largely sick from what they're eating. Uh, and there are professional allies to help you. There are plant-based dietitians now uh, who will do the counseling for you. Uh, I punched in uh, <clears throat> vegan dietitians uh, in Eugene, Oregon, and two of them show up, and they are clearly plant-based folks. Um, I'm, we're going up to Portland, and uh, there are plenty of plant-based dietitians in Portland uh, who will be glad to do this counseling for you. Let her do the counseling. Let her show them the movies. Let her take them shopping. And you see the patient back in a month and see if they're doing better. Now, you, Dr. DeBelba said that this, it's, medicine is a teen sport. The, the plant-based, the dietitian used to be peripheral. She is, I love them because they take away the doctor's excuses. Uh, and they are a key player on the team. I was in Orange County, California a couple days ago. I you know, punched in plant-based dietitians in Orange County. Look who shows up there. There are going to be more and more of these allies. Establish a relationship with them. Refer your patients with them. Pull her on or him on the team. Uh, and you'll be able to create wonderful changes in your patients' lives. <laughs> if you've not seen Forks Over Knives, see this film. Um, and, have, and have the DVD in your office, give it to your patients, have them see it. Uh, it will change their lives. Uh, the fork is your dinner fork, the knife is a scalpel going down your chest. Take, take the fork, go over the knife, uh, believe me. Uh, and um, go to their website. They've got tons of recipes and transition plans. There's lots of information available. It's time to leave caveman thinking behind. If we had more time, I'd go into uh, the canine teeth nonsense and all of that, but we are not carnivorous apes. Kaiser um, already caught on to this. Uh, they were advocating plant-based diets for, uh, for their patients. 
because uh, they know that if even a, a, a fraction of their patients adopt plant-based diets, the billions of dollars they will save in scans not done and chests not open. <clears throat> um, there's lots of information available. You've got to educate yourself about this wonderful subject. Um, you'll be able to uh, make these slides available to you, but uh, go to Cornell. I'll, t I'll take you to PCRM in a minute here. But all of these folks have a ton of, of great information on plant-based diets. Go to my website, drclaver.com, see my webinar on thriving on a plant-based diet. But if you're really serious about it, and I suggest that you become so, I strongly urge that you go to the website of the University of Winchester in the UK. They've got a wonderful six-week course of applied clinical plant-based nutrition uh, in cardiovascular health, uh, uh, endocrinology. Uh, it's an official plant-based nutrition course that I highly recommend. Go to the website of PCRM, Physician Committee of Responsible Medicine. Click on Physicians. Uh, you'll see tremendous resources there, um, evidence-based eating patterns for weight control, for type 2 diabetes, for heart disease, again, for you and your patient. And download their free app. Download their nutrition guide for, for clinicians. You'll have it on your cell phone. If you admit a patient with lupus, punch in lupus, and here's the dietary orders to write. Got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and is sitting in your office, click in RA and, and you'll, have, uh, you'll know what to tell that patient as an outpatient. The information's right on your cell phone. Take advantage of this. Know what you're talking about. You are not alone. The, the, the lifestyle medicine, the plant-based uh, nutrition wave is breaking uh, and rising across the country. Here's UC Davis. Uh, and their plant-based nutrition course. Here's my friends up in Rochester, New York, uh, their lifestyle medicine practice. You can make a living uh, keeping people healthy, and uh, they've got a thriving lifestyle medicine practice. <clears throat> the Plantrition Project brings do plant-based doctors together from around the world. Uh, every, last year, uh, last um, uh, September in Oakland, a thousand plant-based doctors from England and Ireland and Australia and, and Malaysia and India. They, it, the plant-based light is going on in physicians' heads around the world. We're all seeing our patients get healthier through lifestyle medicine. And uh, so uh, join the Plantrition Project. Uh, here was their meeting in, in Oakland. Um, join the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. They've got a rich uh, continuing education program. And you'll meet colleagues who are on this same trail with you, and they too are getting their patients healthy. People say, I want to lifestyle medicine, it's California woo-woo stuff. No, it's not. It's the most powerful medicine of all because it will cure these patients. It will help you reverse these fearsome diseases. And internationally, the Physician Association for Nutrition, that's worthwhile learning, uh, joining. So, we're at the end, and the issue is, you know, what you know about you see. Another way to say it is once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain. No. And my job tonight was to tear this curtain down on these diseases and the role that food plays in both causing them and reversing them. And to put this powerful tool in your hand to at least make you aware that it exists and to urge you to learn about it and master it and bring it to your patients. They will love you. You'll be the most beloved doctor you know. You'll be the happiest doctor you know. I'm the happiest doc I know. My patients get healthy right in front of my eyes. And you can become the happiest doc you know. So it brings me to the point in most of the medical school lectures where I have to ask a provocative question, which is what it really comes down to. Knowing what you know now about the reversibility of the major diseases that you are going to spend the majority of your professional career treating, the question becomes, you want to heal these patients or don't you? Really? Why, why are you going into medicine? You want to heal them? And we can't withhold this knowledge from them. Bring this knowledge to them and start by setting the example yourself. When you walk in that door, they want to see a trim, healthy, uh, bright, um, functional physician with, with shining eyes. Uh, <clears throat> do it yourself, but bring this powerful, powerful knowledge to your practice, and you'll become the happiest doctor you know as well. So <clears throat> this is my message to you. I, I am willing to stay here all evening and answer questions, but uh, hopefully what you know about you see, and now uh, 
Now you know a bit more, maybe you'll, you'll see a bit more as well. I wish you long, healthy, happy careers of uh, healing your patients uh, uh, in the most uh, effective way possible. Thanks for your attention. Dr. Michael Clapper here, and I want to thank you for visiting my channel and for watching this video. I've got a lot more content that I'm creating to answer health-related questions for you, my viewers. So please uh, subscribe to my channel down here. And if you found this video helpful, please like it and comment on it. Thanks for helping to spread the word about the power of whole food plant-based nutrition to heal both people and the planet.